Frontline Chat with Harry Tangy and Dave Wardell. Dum, dum, dum. Brilliant. Why am I big and you're small? Hello, mate. Oh, Dave is not standing under a mast. Oh, yeah, he's on mute. You're on mute, Dave. I should try to unmute you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Frontline Chat. I'm just unmuting Dave because you do not want to hear me all day. Hello, Dave. You're, I can hear you now. You right, buddy? Can you hear me? Oops. This could be interesting. We're just, especially if he doesn't know that we're uh, he's live. This could be career ending stuff. <laughs> can you hear me, Dave? Put a thumbs up if you can. Otherwise, climb a tree for better reception or something. No. Okay. But whilst he is there, we will. Harry, or we'll carry on because he will no doubt find a better okay. I did mess him up a bit really because I gave him a link to this nice nicely early and then I changed it it, it had the wrong time and it said five o'clock on one of the things or whatever so I I deleted it and I didn't give him the new link are you there Dave can you hear us no no okay Okay, well, we're going to talk about, uh, I know that he will come with us very shortly, but, um, and we will be talking about, oh, he's saying no internet, we've had to bring out to meet. Ah, I was hoping to do a little, okay, l- let me just write to him live on air. Um, so we've had to bring out to, uh, bring Finn out to meet his physio. I was hoping to do a little live from here, but it's not working. Uh, so I'm just going to write, no problems, mate. We can see and hear you, you just. Okay, let's see if we comes up with something on that one. Um, it's good. So it seems that Finn is out and about uh, with his dad and probably Tia and somebody else, no doubt. Tia is his youngest, who is massively into the dogs. I know the other girls are as well, but she seems to have a special interest. We'll talk, talk about that in a minute. We're also going to talk... Um, Ah, uh-huh. another message from him. I'll try and get home to join you at the end. So sorry, mate. I thought it'd be a nice update and meet the physio. Uh, okay. No worries at all. So I've got a lot to talk about today. It'll give you a bit of flavour and then Dave will come in at the end and um, when he's got all the Wi-Fi and it'll be a lot better there. If we can just start, I think, with uh, as, as if it's almost as if he was here, isn't it? It's as if he was here. There is Finn snoozing on his new, I think it's this orthopedic bed type thing, which uh, it seems to be the rage at the moment. Um, He certainly likes it. I know Arthur would. Arthur, my dog, loves to climb on top of blankets and pillows as high as he can. You know, you'll have to forgive me a little bit. It's the first sort of cold I've had for years. I haven't had a cold for about five years, seriously. And I thought, I'm not going to take the mick. Um, as I'm getting a bit older, like 52 now, for the first time last year, because I heard if you get a flu bug and COVID, then your doubly is in trouble. One doesn't sort of outweigh the other. So I've been testing on that. I did that before Chester, which we'll talk about in a second, but we're going to put frontline chat on, on stage, which was phenomenal success as far as I was concerned. It was so, it was so much fun. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but to do those tests before that, I thought, this is going to be so inconvenient. <laughs> if, if, not, if not only not, if I'm not there, that's one thing. But if Dave showed positive, oh, my God, you know, uh, it would have been an absolute disaster. And it was lovely that Dave was able to get there. So there is Finn, the lovely Finn. So excuse me if I sniff a little bit. Um, I've got another message from Dave. Uh 
Okay, a uh, little update. He's doing well. Finn is doing well. He's well and truly ready for his physio to start. He's getting stir crazy. Cabin fever has set in and he's been a little monkey wanting to do more and more. He's resting until Tuesday when he can start physio and hydro uh, twice a week. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, my touch typing skills coming in now. Um, read out loud and everyone informed best course I did is just missed the space between the out loud at school better than then I, I didn't do a levels I did a commerce diploma which included touch typing which was great 18 girls two boys recommend that course to anyone when you're 18 right so there so I don't know it's probably entirely sexist but whatever I don't know I apologize in advance and post hence Right, Chester, I'll get this out. This was just immense fun. If you look, those who don't know anything about it, um, it's Frontline Chat, basically it's part of the literary festival. So it was because all of us had written books um, and you can see uh, this is Arthur Smith here. Uh, what an absolute gentleman he is and hysterically funny. I'm not, genuinely, I'm not saying that because I have to come to this amazing gig type advert thing. It was absolutely, he is hilarious. And I recommend if he's coming around the country to you, go and see him. Seriously, he is hilarious. Um, belly laughing stuff. There's Dave looking all cash. Look at him. Look, look, that's his prop. It's like very Robin Williams like, isn't it? Robbie Williams, not Robin Williams. Although he was just as lovely. Uh, so there's Dave. There's me. Notice that, right? Not talking, not talking, listening listening to Dave you notice that I hope you do because that that was probably fast photography that was sports mode so you could catch that moment um and then we have Ian Posen Davies who was hosting it and he did brilliantly what a lovely man he's been in lots of dramas and uh <clears throat> thrillers and stuff like that look uh, look out for him as well and he's a director he's um I think he's a producer and he's a and he's an actor and he's an altogether lovely guy. He was on Frontline Chat and he was talking about his OCD. Um and uh, fascinating. So look at the frontline chat search in Paulston Davies, uh P-U-L-E-S-T-O-N Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S, different word, and he's a and he's a top guy. So I recommend you speak to him as well. That was it was a just a lovely night. Um and uh I say Ian hosted it. And it was just a lovely mix between them. And <laughs> we, there was a lot of fun. There was a, some serious stuff as well. But it is a lot of laughter, I hope. And, and everyone seems to have really enjoyed it. We are going to be doing another one. Uh, the next one is going to be at Halifax. And there is um, in Leeds coming in next April. But next March is the next one coming up in Paynton. Um, it's probably not with um, Arthur Smith or Ian. <coughs> um, but Dave and I will definitely be there. and. Um, potentially uh, someone else as well but come come and see that um we'd love to see you at the palace theater in painting just for a really good night just funny anecdotes a bit of serious stuff a bit of discussion stuff but you will go away definitely feeling like you've had a good night and um, we'll definitely meet in the bar afterwards that's for sure so as we go from there let's take that away from there um as we race on oh yeah there's the oh look at this this is such a cheesy photograph of me i do apologize in advance but like that uh, it's 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 amazing oh it's not that one but there we go i'm just going to do that there you go there we go all distinguished and stuff like that and it's very much can't can't reenact it can't do it but anyway that's for the uh that's for the painting one um 12th of march i know it's my mum's birthday um managed to plug it on devon radio i was on for an hour with um johnny mercer the mp who's very much who's ex royal marine and things so he was good he was he was just really balanced and fair about the police and we could talk about the uh police whether they should have their mobile phones um uh, randomly searched to make sure they're not being misogynist and things and so we will we will talk about that hopefully when dave gets back here otherwise stay with us um but yeah johnny mercer i was quite impressed i'm genuinely i don't really have any political side now i've sort of given up a little bit with politics i say they say you should never give up with politics but 
I think they all seem to be as bad as each other, don't they? Really don't seem to be much good at the moment. But I think we'll start. We'll start with this one. Um, I've been very rude. And because I can't... This is my Lemsip. I have got Lemsip. I haven't had Lemsip in about 10 years. They've improved the taste. Not sponsored by Lemsip. Before we go on, Heather, hello from there. Hello there. Hello, Dave and Harry from Allison. Joe Sky, thank you. Hi, you two. Um, it's great to see you. Um, don't, don't encourage him to. Oh, yes, I should always encourage. This is about the health and safety part of today's society, isn't it? I remember my daughter, when she was about eight, said, Daddy, can I try climb that tree? She's a bit posh. Uh, and I said, Darling, you should, I should be telling you to get down from that tree. That's the difference between the generations, maybe. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Um, so please, just, yeah, Finn is on the mend because you can see it was really cheeky little Finn on, you know, it was just lying down and you wouldn't have known any difference whatsoever. So I think it's definitely a good move. It's definitely a Angie quit. Angie, I don't. So rude. So rude. It's just don't like to make fuss about it, you know. Honestly, I've just been so lucky not to have anything. And and it is it's more than bearable, to be honest. It's it's all right. It's just bad for everyone else because they can see me it's like coughing and splattering everywhere. Um Arthur, Arthur, it's just me in the house today. Everyone's my kids are in Paris. My wife is just she's going to Spain. Oh they're all running away from me as fast as they can. Arthur, you're gonna come in here, buddy. Got some treats somewhere. Well, we'll see if he comes. He's just he was lying on the on the bed, just chilling out. Uh my brother in Bergen has just taken on a little Jack Russell. Uh he's about seven years old from a massive family where the dog was just getting overwhelmed and it just wasn't fitting in. It wasn't getting the work walks it needed. It's a large family, and so he's he's uh bought a dog. Uh he's not bought a dog, so he's gonna be looking after a dog. He's on it's on his boat actually so um he lives in a sailing boat in bergen so um he's yeah he's uh, i'll see if i've got a picture of him um no i don't think i have actually uh but he is well chuffed especially as he <laughs> he never really was into dogs in the past i don't know where that photo is there's trouble when you receive so many photographs from different areas I'll just show you. I will just show you this little photo. My mum's a bit ill at the moment. So, um, I mean, she's got, you know, I say, I mentioned she's got dementia. And this was Garen. Uh, I will just, oh, I can't, I can't move it. Uh, I'll see if I can drag it across. Ah, here we go. And this was Garen saying goodbye because he goes to Bergen. And you can imagine it's, sort of a sensitive time at the moment because just looking at the other stuff that is there no that's fine i think i can it's a sort of sensitive time at the moment there's man blessed heart and <laughs> look at Arthur there this is a new key and there's garen uh my dad used to wear a neckerchief chief i call him uh, man of the mountains but he's just saying goodbye it was a bit of an emotional goodbye because you just don't know what's going to happen you know she's 86 and he's going to be coming back um, soon but you don't know what's going to happen it's like every family isn't it you've got to when people get elderly it gets it's a bit rubbish really doesn't it um and of course he doesn't really know how she'll be with her de development of the dementia as well um arthur is i've been telling everyone that arthur is uh 12 years old he's not he's 11 i've been i've got an extra year bonus year so that's fine um Karen, can't you see? Can't see me on Twitter. I'm really sorry about that. Let's see. I'm just going to see if I am on everyone else's. If if I am on there, um, yeah, good. Um, Karen, I should be because I've just checked and we are on here. So you might want to just uh, restart your phone or whatever and see if you can get through them that way. Um, yeah, great news for Team Finn. It's just, a, it's just a lovely, lovely story. I hope it continues in the right direction with Dave and Finn and his lovely family and the fact we've had a really good week 
on going to Chester and we've got another one coming up in March, I'll say in April. It's getting a little bit exciting anyway. Um, I've got funny things going up my ears. These are my earbuds. Uh, so I can, I don't know why, there's no, oh, I suppose when I play, um, so I get the voices in my head. <laughs> uh, ah, maybe that caused it. No. Yeah. Thin Blue Line, Thin Blue Line UK. You're right. I'm told helps with the cold. It's very good. Thin Blue Line UK gin is phenomenal tasting stuff. I will definitely be buying a bottle. 10 quid of the 30 quid goes to Thin Blue Line, to police officers' families and things like that. Um, or PTSD and things like that to help officers there. Ah, uh, uh, no, that's fine. I, thank you, Alison. I'm coming here to be cheered up. Um, I was hoping Dave would be here to, to but I wouldn't, I've, I would have just been abused by Dave, quite frankly. I wouldn't have had any empathy, I'm quite sure. So, so uh, do you know, when you're talking about dementia, it is so many people, thank you, District 42 Gaming YouTube, uh, really kind of you, uh, but it's, I have to speak to everyone, it's either someone's mother or their grandmother or their auntie has had dementia. It seems to be, uh, it's either Alzheimer's or it's vascular, my mum's got vascular dementia. Um, and it's developing fast, unfortunately, but I will be going down there for another few days. I can't do it until Wednesday, but I'm going to be there. I tend to spend five days down there and then two days up here. Um, by that time, I picked up my son from the airport. He's been to Paris. He's been, he's celebrating, he's 22. He's celebrating their one year anniversary of going out together with his girlfriend, lovely girlfriend. He works in care, funny enough, strangely enough. And, uh, well, they're sure that they're not proposing on the Eiffel Tower, but my, <laughs> his twin sister was saying, for God's sake, don't do your shoelaces up when you're on the top of the Eiffel Tower. So, <laughs> so can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? Um, Jenny, it was so good. It was so good in Chester to all be together. Um, all arranged by the Sophia Khan from Khan Communications. Absolutely phenomenal arrange uh, organizing and um, basically a publicist who enjoys the policing side of things and the arts and brought it together like that. Fantastic. So thank you to her for that. <coughs> uh, wow. Okay. Now we're going fine. Now we've got Australia, but is the Hebrides even further? <laughs> I jest, of course, but I've been the Hebrides watching live for a change rather than on catch up. Always difficult with the elderly when a long way away. It is, but luckily I'm not. And that's why I've been spending five days there, two days back at home, five days in the weekdays, just because there was severe lack of caring opportunities and we were basically dumped in a situation which was like Armageddon. I don't know how like um, an elderly spouse would deal with the situation in the last few months if they had to, uh, were living with... I say a partner who'd got dementia or something because they're not always capable enough to ask for help and scream for help. And, and if they did, like we asked for help and there was nothing there. Lots of very well-meaning people, but we're there now. We've got it sorted. We're sorted. We've, uh, we've managed to bring in a angel from heaven who was with us for five hours, five days a week, which really helps, especially when you both got jobs. Um, Oh, Claire Thomas, goodness, what's happened? I'm in hospital after a fall and the ward I am on has a lot of patients with dementia, extremely sad. Oh, I'm so sorry, Claire, please get better soon. Um, I think we'll move on to this one just for a minute before I ring, read even more. Uh, so COP26, I must have had a cold because I was looking up COP20, um, it's for sure. Um, so I was on G7, I was brought in six weeks before and arranged all the access, validation certificates and things like that. Um, excuse me, I mentioned today, Dave, that when you're involved with that in the policing, there is, people say, oh, it's a phenomenal amount of work. And it is a phenomenal amount of work that you have to do with the security. Some people say, oh, well, it's not worth the money with the security, this is like 100 million or something like that. We'll just consider that we, we are being trusted with um, the safety of everyone else's world leaders. There's not, there's not like seven world leaders here. There's like 150 um, prominent people from other countries where they get protection in their countries. They expect it here. And because 
uh, of protesters and things like that. That's the, when things can get very, very dangerous very quickly. Um, so there has to be all this fencing. There has to be all the security because otherwise we can't guarantee the safety. Um, and therefore, the UK will be left out of stuff. So it's not a question. You can't just have a little bit of security because my saying I use the security is as strong as your weakest point. So if you just save money on the fencing, then they just rush the place like that and then, you know, you forget it. It's been, and then it would look really bad across the world if there they are banging at the windows of the venues um, uh, in danger. So it has to be done. Uh, whether you believe in politics or whether they're actually saying anything that will change anything, etc., that's another matter. It's another matter of which we are not there. Um, Stephanie says I keep breaking. I do apologise. You see, I am away at the moment. What I will be doing is improving. Okay, uh, I am back and I've got the Ethernet cable in there as opposed to Wi-Fi and this should be fine. Thank you. Ben and Anots, this signal is fine for you, but I have suddenly got about 10 times better signal sound, so that should be good. Um, so, but thanks, Stephanie. It's useful to know this sort of thing. Um, Julie, Julie is, Julie, I think you're, you're happy. <laughs> I like your logo picture. Um, your bio. Uh, Julie told us last week that she was a bit nervous about coming because she has you've been suffering a bit of anxiety. You you said that on in the public forum, so I'm I'm hoping you don't mind me saying that again. Um, and so you were a bit worried that you would be able to come or not, and you did come with us. And I even, I think I even bought you a drink in the bar, didn't I? Uh, I think I did. Um, so <laughs> I've had a couple since by then. Um, so it was really good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. It was very flattering. And I, by the look of your expressions, you seem to be very happy. I hope you were. Um, uh, oh, Claire Thomas. Yeah, I know. My wife is uh, similar. Uh, slip disc and now neurology problems got to have intense physio to learn to walk again. Mm, is the most painful thing. And I know with people at the moment, the way the ambulance service at the moment, as hard as they try, but with the queues and the backlogs, if you're just in pain, uh, then you've got a long wait. I remember my wife was on the floor for 10 hours. A serious situation. Managed to just get a doctor to bring morphine and so we we got morphine for it, literally to get off the floor it's bad so if you're dying the NHS are fantastic if you're in pain unfortunately you're back of the queue and Claire I don't know if you had that situation but my god it's horrible uh, <laughs> that's okay that's uh, appreciated it was lovely to have your company there so going back to G26, not to G20 as I said before it is uh, it was a phenomenal thing for the G7 that we had recently in Cornwall. And yeah, it was lovely and this, it was sunny. But remember, you've got the problems of, uh, and I'm keeping that up for date. You've got the problems of, it went on for three weeks. Um, it's like 10,000 officers, I think it was. So you've got to put them all in beds. Now, I'll tell you what happened in G7 is the Met. This is what we're blaming. A lovely, gorgeous Met. Um, they sent too many. Or well, they sent more than we were expecting is probably the better way of saying it. And so the more took the rooms of that the others were expecting to get. And therefore, we had a bit of a situation where it was a slight meltdown situation for that evening. So that and in Cornwall, there was very few, there's very few accommodation. But you've got to think accommodation, Scotland, where it was, I'm sure there was hopefully more accommodation. Uh, so it was slightly easier. But you've also got to keep the bill down. It's 100 million or whatever if it is at the moment. If you bring everyone, you know, top hotels are all full. That everyone else has wanted to go to all the press and all these de delegates and things like that. So it's, it's keeping it to a low, lowest level possible. Some people insist they don't want to share a room. When I went on these things, I tended to just, I, I, you know, I sleep on Dartmoor and Bodmin Moor, for Christ's sake. You know, I, I sort of, I, you do earn a bit of overtime. But boy, do you own it because you are probably not sleeping much. Your long days in G7, it was hot days or freezing nights. Here, you're wet or you're cold. 
uh, no doubt. Um, and sometimes it can be very boring if you're in a position where you're just literally looking at a metal grid for four hours before you get relieved. So you certainly own, earn it. Um, and uh, I think it, the fact that there was such little press on the protests and things shows how much of a success it was. Um, unless I've missed a hell of a lot. But there's been very little in the press about uh, about protesters getting through policing behavior if you like and all this sort of thing we had a couple with the g7 but if you think about it you've got ten thousand cops or something someone someone's going to do something that will disappoint you at some point probably but hopefully that will be it there won't be any more uh good evening harry thanks for a great show in chester robert thank you very much that's very kind of you indeed um god i i sound terrible i know i'm sorry i should do a voiceover voiceover voice thingy anyway uh so um right going on thank you very much good evening right so i just take that one off what have we got now oh yeah i thought this was quite funny because you do get these things these people like they put legal advisor or, or legal you know uh, volunteer or whatever then they've got most of them have got absolutely no qualifications whatsoever but they go around with these placards on their back and it's like um they're not they're not um and, and here's another one i thought it was just a bit funny really uh don't talk to the blue bib cops they're here to gather intelligence on you and other protesters i mean it's a bit uh you know yeah, they're, there's nothing sneaky about them. They're not um, doing surreptitious, like, undercover recording or anything like that. They'll chat to them. They'll chat to you. And they'll explain if they, uh, because policing is, they, people think there's, um, you know, the suspicious people think it's a, a big conspiracy to do as much damage to these people who just want to protest. So if they want to protest peacefully, that's great. Um seriously you've got nothing else better to do is it is it a them and us situation it is as far as she's concerned um it's like come on get over yourself do a pro do a protest where it's peaceful protest shout and scream as much as you like but don't be abusive don't do it in front of a, an officer's face like that that's rude and it's offensive and it's quite dangerous to be honest at the present time so don't do it um but that is they unfortunately do start convincing themselves that they are completely right they're against us you know fighting the authority of the system and they, they just need to chill out a little bit these look very bored but they had them following them around and i thought it was good from pc roger uh, ps police sergeant roger harking who said uh uh one of my uh one of plt colleagues had this lady following him around for an hour or so at cop 26 if you want to know what we do come and talk to us we don't need to know your name telephone number etc it's good to talk <laughs> and it is police liaison um and it's hmm, it's important to know that they are still police officers and they make very well known that but if they can quash any rumors it's a bit like when i was on vip and there was some paparazzi there I knew if I said, look, rather than crowding us here, if if I could tell you that the next place they are going to go is is there, and they're going to go along this route, and they're going to go to that shop there or whatever, um, and they were a bit suspicious, but when they did that, they then I knew that they could trust me, and. And I knew there was no danger in telling them that. They were just going to be as good. They were right in their faces, pushing and getting through. Um, and yes, it wasn't millions of them. So it was you get the press on side, get them to trust you, and then um, do that. Um, and it's a sort of similar way with the liaison officers is, is if you speak to a few people and they go, oh, yeah, it seems fair enough. You know, um, literally here to breach the police. Yeah, you can protest there, do that, whatever. And it's um, And the police can tell you, uh as things progress or whatever what they're allowed to tell you in the public you can just speak to them see what they say hopefully recruit a few people that would be good wouldn't it um shall we move on to let's move on to this this little oh look he's probably a very nice man but the police generally don't find sir tom windsor 
very pro-police. Anyway, he's he's in charge of the police inspectorate, right? So he's in charge of usually retired chief constables and they, uh, you know, people who've proven themselves well in the policing area to go around and assess all police forces and see where they are falling short. And it's where you say, you know, when um, occasionally forces uh, say they're not there, there was headlines of they're not recording the right level of this crime or they're recording it in a bad way. That's usually come from the inspector, conservative uh, inspector, the inspector. So, um, yeah, so uh, basically we need them. All right. So I'm not slagging off that at all. That needs to be done. Um, but when Tim Windsor says uh, because of the misogyny and all that, let me just just tell people, look, please just I started thinking, is this right? Have I missed this? Because in Denver Cornwall, there's no way we would have accepted that sort of language. There's no way we would have someone um, joking about a female officer's boobs or anything uh, about, oh, you must be on your period or something that sort of behavior to banter is banter if it is in one go if it's involving everyone if someone is a target that is not banter that is bullying nasty and stuff that i understand a lot of women have to put up with gen generally i would hate to have thought that it had happened on my watch in my uh in, in my force and i i never experienced it i said well you're a guy you wouldn't recognize it i think i would I would, but I certainly have no idea how it feels, that's for sure. But I think I'd recognise if someone was using it against someone else. And I think my the officers I was with would have as well and wouldn't have accepted it as well. So should they? Should they? Should they not? No, they shouldn't look at officers' phones willy-nilly. Um, because the trouble is, there were no canteens. And so they took the canteens away. So all your... Um, diffusing and all that chilling out with you know and it wasn't all canteen culture like they used to I used to love early turn in the canteen breakfast playing euchre or whatever if the if the times permitted because in the morning that's possibly when you could do it when all the criminals were asleep and in sleep or in custody um and then of course that went so people started using whatsapp and of course now um, a lot of police officers don't use WhatsApp because if they are a present when something inappropriate comes in and that is found in the system, they'll say, well, why didn't you challenge that? Therefore, you're suspended as well. So basically, it's a great. And now somebody, if somebody's going to randomly look into my phone to trawl someone's phone, somebody's making decision as to whether that is inappropriate or not. And that might be an inquiry that might take some time. That's stress I don't need. So guess what? I wouldn't go on WhatsApp. I wouldn't go on any social media. I wouldn't do anything. So therefore, you've immediately shut off the police from everything and you stop the police talking to each other socially uh, because that's the way we use we socialise on our phones at the moment, isn't it? So that's dangerous for PTSD because they can't talk and chat and whatever. Now, sometimes there's inappropriate stuff that comes, which it's not illegal, it's not offensive, it's not racist or anything like that. but it's just not my thing. I, 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 it's not something I'm associated with. So it's, you probably had it on your social media where you just ignore it. You know, it's not it's not my thing. I just ignore it. Um, it's a joke or something like that. But n now I'd be thinking, oh, oh, his phone, if their phone is randomly searched, so I'll be criticised. Will it be made of more than what it was meant to be and whatever? Or, or would they think, oh, well, is it a hate crime because it was making a joke like any comedian would about something somewhere or whatever? Um, but I can assure you there is, uh, it, well, that, that's the problem. That's the problem. They wouldn't use the social media. They'd come off it and deal with the repercussions of that when police officers attend work. Normal members of the public, are re they're recruited from normal members of the public, the police are, of course, aren't they? So they don't go in a filter to suddenly make them these hateful people. There's 130,000 cops out there, 130,000. And there's a handful of nasty, horrible incidences. And um, I would also just keep an eye when you see these incidences. I always check to see what level of service they've got. Um, and with the those two vile people who took photographs of that body, um, murder victim i don't want to go into detail of it you know it what it all is i think one was had been in a matter of weeks or something and the other person had been in over two just over two years so very early in their service completely 
unacceptable. And so maybe it's like, yeah, maybe it's a vetting thing. Maybe it's a rush to get these officers in. And so maybe we do need to look a little bit more because um, I can only say I've been present with a lot of dead people and with a lot of officers with dead people. And that's included children as well. And I will tell you that even in that forensic post-mortem with that six-year-old child that I was with, the utmost respect was given to that deceased. The utmost respect. And uh, I was literally scooping someone, a part of someone into, um, to preserve that organ because they were literally, oh, I don't want to go into too much, but literally the crows were, were thinking, it can get pretty messy, shall we say. Um, and you do that as much as you can in the most respectful way possible, because you think if that was my mother or my son, how would I like it to be treated? So to have these vile individuals treat a body like a trophy almost, like, oh, look how cool I am with this, is just disgusting. And I can tell you now, I asked my close friends up and down the country, have I got this wrong? What is going on? Because it seems to be one thing after another. And they're, they're just as astonished and aghast as it is me. It's, it's just it's just outrageous. Um, but it's got to remember that it is a vile handful of these things. This, I personally think, is a knee-jerk reaction to keep the press quiet. It's a tick box thing. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I think we should weed out the misogynists. Look, what a horrendous title. I know that's the press as well. This is the Times. It's, I don't know if that's exactly the words he said, but probably it's in quote marks to weed out the misogynists. I don't know. I don't know, I'll be honest with you, but whatever. Um, I don't think police officers are going to feel, well, your recruiting is going to go down as well, because if you join the police, you can get rid of your life, your social life, um, get rid of your social life. They complain about the police should they go onto dating apps and things like that. Well, so you go, don't, don't socialise, don't go on our dating apps, and certainly don't chat up someone you meet at work. Um, we know that on that last one, there's always... If somebody's particularly vulnerable, like you're talking to a victim and things, but if you've met um, someone or a witness that is later down the road, there's lots of police officers who've got married and had children and, and everything's been fine like that. But if something is definitely, in my view, if something is definitely uh, an authoritative figure taking advantage of a vulnerable person, then that's a clear no-no. Of course it is. So, yeah, it seems like the police human rights have gone out the window so you're going to struggle with recruiting and you're going to marginalise them. It's just a horrible place to work if you think, oh, right, OK, I'm not trusted. I'm not trusted. What, because of a few individuals? Um, Donna, you're absolutely correct uh, with saying you're, my mum just retired after 18 years with the ambulance service. Can you imagine what she has witnessed spare a thought for the dreadful pressures they're under it's awful and the guys and girls in the wagons can't be in more than one place at a time unfortunately i do feel for people waiting a long time but if someone has stopped breathing or is trapped in a car wreck bleeding profusely sadly that needs dealing with first what we need is better facilities for the other staff stuff like more medic cars in the road perhaps yeah it's just, it's more more staff friend of mine's in the ambulance i'm i'm sort of frustrated paramedic i'd love to have been a paramedic as well to be honest i enjoyed that side of the policing side but I mean, or at these these ambulance drivers who, who get these ambulance drivers. That's going back about a thousand years. Uh, paramedics and technicians, and they are such lovely people when you meet them. And they're going from job to job to job, or they're waiting with a casualty outside, with outside casualty only, aren't they? For forever, they don't get a break. I mean, they literally. Uh, it's a frustrating situation we are at the moment, isn't it? Um, Colette, you're right. I think uh, protesters at the moment, um, I don't know if it's, it's been because of that media thing, it's the acceptability because of, well, comments like Sir Tom Windsor, who's said troll police phones to weed out misogynists. So, of course, protesters are going to go up to um, officers' face and call them misogynists, call them racist, call, um, uh, especially um, with Black Lives Matter situation, um, incredibly brave um Black and ethnic officers on the front line, the abuse they came under uh, was horrendous um, by other black and ethnic people. Um, so I, they have most respect for me at all as well, because uh, they have even more to deal with and cope with. 
Um, so yeah, they are rude and disrespectful. So a lot of them say, well, well, it's not illegal. It's not illegal. No, it's rude. Shut up. Don't do it. That's for some reason, because it's not illegal. It means they think they can shout in someone's face like that. Uh, Stephanie, I'm glad you've sorted your Wi-Fi out. Welcome. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> yeah, Alison, you're quite right. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it is. Notice I said, well, maybe. That is 30 years of being a police officer where I know that someone would make a complaint um, and I'm still not cut free of it. Uh, no, Human Rights Act doesn't belong to... But the good news is, is that uh, I was on that Radio Devon with uh, Michael Checker and Dave Fitz. Uh, good, but I love being on them. I seem to be on there potentially like well three months ago now now and then in three months time so that'd be good in february I'll be on there as well it's just a really relaxed uh, hour there with with another guest talking about something that is relatively policey and all that sort of thing and they had a couple of phone-ins <laughs> the phone-in from one was suspiciously a police officer but we're very pro uh i think even uh i think it was michael or fitz who said hmm yes i wonder if he actually works at charles cross police station um but I think there's a lot of members of public who think exactly the same. They're very balanced in their view. And they say, yeah, there's some idiots. Of course, there's some idiots. But let's not forget the great majority aren't. And it's really important we treat them with respect. And we don't um, just undermine them and uh, devalue what they're doing. And completely, because it's tough. I've had cops saying, do you know what, Harry? I've had it. I've had it. Come to work, getting abused, seeing work abuse on the media, seeing abuse on social media. And I'm doing all I can to help people. And then all these cops, when they turn up to jobs where they help people, they go, oh, you're all right, actually. You're all right. You're for cop. And yet they're all told that. Um, it can give you an impression, can't it, that we are saturated with bent cops and misogynists and things like that. Excuse me. Uh, I keep breaking up still, but um, I'm surprised. Um, it's Jackie's, Jackie says I keep breaking up, but I don't. I say it seems to be all right with some, Jackie. So, <clears throat> um, okay, Donna, I, I will. I'll accept that. I've come across an officer recently, Harry, who's a sort of discussing mindset towards women in general. So it does happen. Some of the things I've heard out of his mouth off duty, but in reference to female colleagues, was shocking, and that <clears throat> that um, it's just really depressing to hear that quite frankly. Um, uh, and, and I have heard that um, from a friend of mine who uh, was a volunteer and witnessed something going on. And funny, strangely enough, there's been developments with the individuals involved now. So eventually, they seem to get weeded out. Uh, oh, Janet Butler, somebody I... I uh, I respect very much Janet. Um, the representatives from from the inspector I used to meet were very positive, supportive, and practical, working with the force to ensure good practices, etc. This sort of suggestion is out of kilter, I think. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I tend to agree. Um, the inspector is. It's important, like I said earlier, to bring out where certain forces are failing because they've got the comparison with all the others and they've got minimum standards they need to meet. And so if it wasn't that, uh, you'd be relying on PCCs alone. And the PCCs, police crime commissioners, can't actually necessarily um, be able to um, assess their own force with other forces and whatever. So, yeah. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, should Yes, they should. Should officers be allowed to use their own phones whilst on duty? Yeah, absolutely. Do you use your phone at work? Um, why not? Does ambulance uh crews yeah do they use their what you know it's just it's another human right that you need to you know they've got what so how do, how would their um how would i hear an urgent message about my mum you know so we have to go through the control room and get that long-winded thing of being on the you know if it's 101 they sit there for 35 minutes well yeah yeah maria definitely they should have um and in fact i used my my phone for a lot of my Twitter, because the software was damn sight better than the ones the force gave me. Um, so, yeah, I didn't take anything that would have breached any protocols or um, 
you know, any laws or anything like that, human rights or anything like that. So, <clears throat> yeah, I used my phone for that. In fact, at one point, I had three phones I had to have. So I just forwarded everything to my, even my work phone onto my own phone because it was just better technology. Um, yeah, and, and you're right, Rose, the police do need a safe place to unwind and support each other because it's, it's um, yeah, canteens have gone. They say when you're closing the canteen, it's not just where you eat, it's the heart of the station. That you've ripped out so yeah um steph thank you very much do you sell signed copies of both your books that's the one corner scoop was a novel and that's the farms of fatals it's gone really well still selling really well farms of fatals so i'll probably put something on my social media um and do one of those sort of retweet things and it'll be like the first hundred because funny enough the random the random selector for the winner can only do a hundred. It won't do more than a hundred. I don't know why, but I guess there's probably something that would cost hundreds of pounds that I could do. But and I wouldn't be. I don't want to be naughty by saying um, one of the people who retweet it. And there's like three hundred retweets because you know the the last two hundred aren't going to get a look in. But so yeah, I'll do one of those. I'll do one of those. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to show your interest. Um, and I think this is it, Joe. Joe Sky Force Minx. I love these titles. It sounds like police are getting targeted continuously about one thing or another. The folk doing that, in my opinion, maybe need to have a week in the police force as an officer, see just how difficult the job is and see how it feels from the other side of the fence, so to speak. To me, it sounds like the police are already trying to do the best they can with their hands politically tied. Yeah, and they often they can't actually answer. They can't answer themselves. And sometimes the bosses where I think there's some bosses and some other forces and some selected forces the larger ones, where I think they've been promoted very quickly, probably some beyond their abilities. Certainly not the case with my Devon Cornwall, which I thought were good people, people, you know, really good management style and support, really good. <clears throat> Maybe, no, I'm not going to say with the county forces, but I think with the Met, you've, you've got the whole eyes of the world on them. And I think some bosses there, I won't name some because I know some bloody good bosses there, like Dan Ivey, top boss, came from Devon and Cornwall. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, I think they're more politicians um, than police, and they haven't spent two minutes in each rank, and they start believing what they hear on social media and the media. They, when was the last time they were shoulder to shoulder with those officers on the front line doing stop searches? receiving some of the abuse they were getting, getting an idea of what the aura, the, the, uh, about what the atmosphere is in, in amongst the section to see if it is a misogyny all over the place or whatever, you know, just go alongside it's, you know, because you can overhear stuff in other rooms, you know, when you're walking by or you're in a parade room and people don't always know if you're there, they come in and they're chatting and, or having a bit of banter as such. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think, do more than that. And I, I think it really annoys me when these people, these high ranking officers just left the police and just slag it off completely. Because the question is asked, well, why didn't you do more when you're in there for a start? Um, and often there's usually some money behind their motives, which uh, trying to get another career. Um, yeah, as long as it's coming down. Well, Donna, you, you're saying yes, use uh, personal phone. As I said before, I wouldn't use my personal phone and I wouldn't use any phone for anything that well, I wouldn't use my work phone for anything that was sensitive like that. Um, not in the middle of an RTC or other sensitive job. Um, there's RTCs and there's RTCs, there's damage only and there's stuff like that, isn't there? So, um, but yeah, full attention on the victim and not taking photographs, bits and pieces of crazy. Yeah, but I think that's probably unfair. I don't know how many victims have been left whilst officers go doing selfies around the, the scenes. Um, uh, then, yeah, confidentiality is maintained. And yes, we used to be allowed to have ours with us in the hospital ward, but we would use them appropriately. And yes, the ambulance could. And that's that's it in the end of the day, isn't it? It's got to be used appropriately. When it, and I think people are pretty clear when something is appropriate or not. I don't think the public are aware just how hard it is to meet the criteria to join the police. I joined as a special. And the scrutiny was beyond anything I could have imagined. Yet the odd bad egg may slip through. And sadly, the minority becomes the majority of the minds of the same people. I have got a theory as well. I think they've always said the sergeant rank was the most important rank because um, 
you it was for me it was like it's almost like the parents of the family and so i would say to people was people some people say oh yeah the police are terrible the police are terrible i'd look at the side i'd look at the sergeant of the person their experience because if you've got quite an influential inappropriate officer say uh and you've got young impressionable ones around them if you haven't got a strong sergeant strong leadership so it's pc sergeant and then it goes inspector chief inspector superintendent chief superintendent blah, blah, blah. then um that starts to spread because people think well they want to fit in don't they and they start feeling well yeah it's acceptable yeah it's a bit of banter and they just and that's where it all starts falling apart you find that they're scruffy that shirts are a bit you know hanging out or they start being you know trying to look like cool cops instead of police officers so that is the thing if you've got a good sergeant good strong sergeant who says willing to have a laugh have a good time make sure the crew are happy but professional all the way down all the way down the line um it's got to be you've got to switch on and then deal with people as if they were your family as if they're now you, that that's if they're the offenders or the victims witnesses whatever you treat them each one as if they are your family and you won't go unless you hate your family and as if they were an imaginary nice family of yours um so what do i think a detention officer yeah a lot of them go for that i always take i take the mic bit of bants no i take the mic i with people's detention officers saying you know that probably their eyes will grow over because there's no windows in these cells <laughs> But um, and I, a lot of the time it doesn't smell too nice down there. Um, but what a what a job! What a job! And what a, it's quite an interesting job. You certainly deal with um, the worst levels of society. And when I say that, I don't mean the worst people. I mean because some people are there because of what their situation has they've been thrown into and they've made the wrong choices. But some are very nasty, horrible individuals, and you've still got to take live scans which is like little fingerprints from child pedophiles and stuff like that um child people you know pedophiles and and people that you just want to do horrible things to or don't want to have anything to do with them um but you've got to remain professional and get through that system so detention officers yeah i would certainly recommend it without a doubt i've got friends who've gone from that from control room um and uh plenty have gone through it really good experience learn a lot and good community with the other staff within the detention officers the custody sergeants that work in there and other people like that um going back to the phones is would if that happened would it end well, yeah where would it end would other professions be subject to the same scrutiny it does seem to be the police only the police and just the police um it does seem to be that uh you know, if you've fallen short of integrity, if you're a politician, you get fired, you're sacked. But then six weeks later, you're on, you're brought in because everyone's forgotten about you on a, on a different role altogether. Well, the police, you're sacked, you're sacked. Or you're hanging in tender hooks for 10 years or so while the IOPC take the finger out their bottoms and decide that uh, then you get to the court and then the courts throw it out saying, what's this rubbish doing here? So that's a quick summary of the IOPC situation nowadays. I'm glad Dave isn't here. Um, <laughs> uh so the uh, <laughs> we'll move on from there shall we uh, <laughs> yes julie uh farms course like uh, advanced for stages aren't they yes um i think there's a case in <laughs> i certainly wasn't a uh, one of the chapters in there which was where um motorcycle victim had open heart surgery basically they cut through the ribs and open everything up and I can I didn't do this <laughs> I did the incredibly technical task of holding a torch over the torso as it was opened up and they manipulated the heart um and I could see the lungs that were being inflated by the tube and it's all very exciting because I was very interested in that role mm -hmm. um so good skills good skills on that one uh but yeah we used to don't anymore we used to cannulate so that you get needles into the arm fluids in um because on ARVs we would be to scenes quicker than most people um usually going to further areas just seeing if that's Dave that's just came came into us there um and so it was quite useful to uh be able to do something whilst you're waiting for the ambulance because the ambulances um had a queue of jobs and sometimes you had to try to plug the hole fill it with fluids and oxygen 
stop it. And torn so we'd have tourniquets, oral pharyngeal airways, your tubes, nasal pharyngeal airways, nose. You can't put that one in while someone's conscious. They'll gag on it, but you can put a nose one in, but you've got to make sure they haven't got any cranial damage. Uh, so it's it's those sort of things. Uh, and even some severe painkillers when they were needed as well, but you need the patient's permission for that. Um, that was one of the latest things. Um, so what have we got? Uh, oh, I'm just going to see on here to see whether... I wanted to show you this, just changing the subject completely. I saw this. And I thought, well, that's very interesting. Uh, I do know some of the prot officers in here. Um, so this was a bit of VO. This is Prince Charles. I worked with Prince Charles many, many times over the 15 years when he visited as Duke of Cornwall. Um, um, there's a lot of duchy land here. Um, and he spends um, about four or five days here roughly every year in Devon and Cornwall. So we were quite busy with him, lots of other VLPs. But... And you'll see the crowd. This is in Brixton. I think it's this lovely bit of footage here. And again, it just shows another side to how people look at the role. I will declare here that I very much rate Prince Charles. He's completely underrated as far as, oh, you should jump to Prince William. He's, he's going to be great as well. Um, Charles, Prince Charles is a uh, very hard worker. He works till midnight most of the time. He's basically a CEO of a very big company with the Dutchie side of things. But... Um, and he does stuff that I think is a lot higher quality than would have been if it was just left to the masses of um, building companies trying to compete with each other um, and build just red brick blocks. Uh, but anyway, let's have a look at this. That's my biased view. I love this. Look at them smiles and having now those processes there. I had an amazing time with. You got prot officer. Um, I'll just go on as that. Oh, actually, what this guy says is really sweet. All right. So prot officer here. You see his eyes all over the place because he is basically what you're doing here. You're looking at all these people. You're looking at basically what their expression is in the face. They tend to if they're nervous, if they are, is it something they're up to something? Where are their hands? If their fans are both on a phone and they've got a little cheesy grin on their face and they're looking quite relaxed, then you can pretty much dismiss those, but not entirely. Because if you're reaching distance of a knife, that is it. You don't want it on your watch where something happens. Or it could be eggs or something like that. And it's uh, in, instead of um, a walkabout in Brixton with a community with Prince Charles hitting the paper, it will be Prince Charles with eggs all down his face and stuff like that. Um, and it would be a headline about how, how much Prince Charles is hated in Brixton or something like that, which is just doesn't seem to be the case here. All right. So that is why it's to avoid, first and foremost, an attack on um, a VIP, but also to try to avoid that uh, embarrassment side of things as well. I had an amazing time with you at the Commonwealth Federal Government meeting in Malta. I remember you very, very well. You're a great man. We're very, very proud of you, sir. Very proud of what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, I do know this protection officer very well. I've worked with him many times. And he was doing sort of something thing there that we just highlighted. I won't go into too much detail. But sometimes you just don't want to give the benefit of the doubt. You want to treat everyone fairly. Um, but, and of course, sometimes I'd get information to, from um, intelligence to say, um, because sometimes you, you, will, you, you will be given a sheet of people that are, have got a certain uh, fixation. On, on royalty and they've got previous for doing something that's quite embarrassing or, or or whatever or could be a security risk but it's how you deal with that you don't just jump on them and ruin the day you can do it in very subtle ways if somebody might shake someone's hand you even learn how to to undo someone's hand from shaking them quite subtly but by force okay because if they just shake their hand and keep it shaking and shaking and shaking they don't want to let go they've got future king in there and they don't want to let go at all so it's very friendly but it's like thank you very much you know uh and things like that so it uh to the point obviously these guys are armed and they're able to react very quickly if they need to but it is that they will have gone through this to me looks like a training exercise there's so many times where you have the vip as a stooge and you have the vip protection officers either side in as as a training exercise we have no idea what was going to go on um we didn't know if it was a biggie or a small one or whether it was absolutely nothing happened at all.
<laughs> Look how excited she is. It's great. There's some camera as well. It's good. It's usually my got phones now, isn't it? I'm sick of the camera. Look how busy it is. Look, so they've got officers up the front here and here, giving a little bit of giving a bit of warning, advising. Yeah. I, I've, I've been in situations where things have happened and um, it's all happening off just to the right. He has, His Royal Highness has seen exactly what's going on, but he will stay calm, cool, the professional to the core. He will act as if it's nothing is happening and he will have complete faith, I hope, in the officers around him. So. <laughs> And there we are. So I, I just thought that was a really lovely footage there. It's just the community coming out. Yeah, there's no mask, is there? Which is a bit strange to see at the moment. Um, yeah, it was a really warm welcome outside the NatWest branch here in Brixton. Charles told one well-wisher who inquired about the Queen's health that she was doing well. Uh, I think that was the guy that we were just listening to on there. Oh my God, it's three minutes past five. I'm going to end with this, guys. I'm going to end with this. This is Tia, and this is what's coming up with what she's doing. Sorry, Dave wasn't able to man, uh, make it. I do apologize for you having to listen to my drivel. But here we go. Last thing from Tia. Hopefully, you've got the sound as well. Uh, we're preparing for a 25 drinks till Christmas. Um, so, if you, if you don't know what that is, uh, it's that. Basically, I um, I do 25 tri I do a trick every day on the lead up to Christmas, and when it gets to Christmas, you've got a very exciting game to play, and most probably a uh, Christmas Christmas dinner to search for. Uh, I'm giving you all ideas now of what I'm doing, um, so I will end it there before I spoil Papa too much. Papa wants to say a dance by. Oh, don't drop things. <laughs> so there we go thank you very much indeed thank you for your kind comments in the moment karen you're the hero of the moment 303 a.m in australia thank you very much for that um and i think please join us i think we're going to be doing one next week join us again thank you let's see if i've got rid of my man flu take care everyone all the best